Uh, hi, uh, I'm Mark Abel, and I'm the Associate Director for the Institute for Energy Efficiency. And uh, we're going to welcome you to our chat today. And I uh, wanted to, uh, uh, I'll, I'll be sort of the moderator of the talk, although uh, Professor Lukowski will be uh, moderating his own work, and he's willing to take questions during the talk. So, uh, so feel free to ask questions either in the audience here or from Zoom. If you want to put it in the chat or raise your hand on that, we'll, we'll find that. You can also, uh, you know, speak on Zoom as well, whatever you prefer. If we, if we can't hear you, whatever, then, you know, please put it in the chat and we'll, we'll be sure to pull it up and give it to Michael. So, so uh, I wanted to welcome you to Probabilistic Modeling of Renewable Energy Generation, Measuring Risk in Daily Grid Operations by Professor Michael Lukowski. And Michael is a uh, eminent professor here in statistics and applied probability. And he runs the center here as well. Um, and let's see, he's got a PhD. PhD from Princeton, if I remember correctly, did a postdoc at Michigan. I'm a, I'm a Michigan guy, so, you know, you know makes me happy too. Um, and he's been here for quite a while. He's the chair of, uh, of that department here. And, um, and with that, is there anything else you want me to say, tell, explain about you? No. All right, so you got a real treat in store. This uh, looks like a really interesting chat. So with that, uh, welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Um, so um, as was mentioned, I, I'm uh, from the Department of Statistics about Probability. Uh, my main area of research is quantitative finance. So I'm co-directing the uh, CFMAR, Center for National Architectural Research. Um, and I work, my group works in quite the, the diverse range of topics. Um, and so this, um, this new subject of um, renewable energy modeling is something we got into just a few years ago. So um, Certainly this is a bit of a, speaking here is a bit of an outreach for me because I, I'm definitely not a um, electrical or power engineer. Um, and so I can, I'm only an expert in a small slice of this, of this huge world um, and I'm learning quite a bit. Um, so let me jump in. Oh, so now it doesn't want to work. I think it's, there we go. Let me see, yeah, okay, so now we're good. Okay, so, um, this talk is going to be about quantification of risk. So this is really kind of my area of expertise is, is uh, sorry for quantification with application to risk management. Um, and the specific application is um, the risks of renewables in daily grid operations, All right? So uh, one thing I want to sort of set this, this stage for is that the focus is going to be exclusively on daily power grid operations. So this is not, planning for the future, 10 years in the future. It's not about thinking how uh, on a system level things look like um, on large time scale. This is the, the short time scale of day ahead, okay? And so uh, the way that the, the day ahead scale, uh, um, time scale is, 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 you know, is important in practice is that this is a time frame where um, the unit commitment and the coming dispatch are happening daily. Right. So the way that the grid works, and I have a couple of slides on this, is the independent system operators daily have to plan for the next day. Um, and then there's essentially a mop-up operation in real time as things unfold. Um, but the main decisions are happening on a day-ahead basis because that's when we can schedule different uh, generators, um, which often, many of them have ramp times on the scale of um, six to 12 hours. And that's, that's why you have to have this day-ahead planning. So that's not going to go away um, anytime soon. And so um, the crux of the talk is, is bringing in statistical tools to help with this planning, in, 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 especially in the, in, the, in the context that more renewables means more uncertainty and something that was a, a marginal question in the past becomes more and more relevant. Um, and in particular, this whole uh, project is sponsored by ARPA-E. Um, this is the Advanced Research Project Agency Energy. Um, so this is kind of the, the counterpart of DARPA. Um, and this is a piece of the of, of, uh, Department of Energy. Um, and so um, our project is called Orpheus. Um, that's the logo, which is a little bit of a, um, that's supposed to represent something as uh, with Orpheus and the snake. Um, and so the, 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 kind of the center of Orpheus is in, is in Princeton. Um, the department actually when I got my PhD uh, about 20 years ago. Um, um, but um, there's sort of a, it's, it's, it's a multi-campus team. And so there's uh, several people here, including Mashvedov, who is in the, um, in the audience. Um, and then also uh, we have um, practitioners. So Glenn Swindle, um, he's a, 
financial risk practitioner um, running his own uh, consulting business. And he's, he's, a, he's been an expert in this domain for, for many years. Um, so the um, ARPA is uh, bread and butter are probably projects are much closer to what um, IEE does. Um, and so um, for ARPA, it was a kind of a step out of their usual um, wheelhouse to look to, to, to get in touch with um, mathematicians, statisticians um, in order to do this risk quantification um, in, the, in, in, in the area of um, daily, um, um, not necessarily daily, but you know, at, at the um, grid operations. All right, so um, let me start with this. So um, I know how you will hear now heard about Jesse Jenkins. Uh, he's a, a professor at, um, in Princeton. Um, he has been one of the um, main um, popularizers and advocates of uh, investment in long-term investment in, in, um, in renewable energy and how to get to, to zero net emissions in 2050, something like this. So he really likes to think about on the scale of decades, kind of the opposite of what we're doing. Um, but um, he's also has a huge following on Twitter. Um, so um, here's a recent quote from him. Um, so you know, this is, was a snarky comment about saying that um, people complain that the sun doesn't necessarily shine and there's uh, you know, uh, clouds and also same thing with the same problem with the wind, um, right? So this is of course uh, a very well-known refrain that renewable energy is inherently um, unpredictable. Okay, so this is I think not a news to anybody. Um, and so you know, he's saying, why, can, why do you keep bringing this up as if this is something new? This has been known since the beginning of time. All right, so now um, to be clear why this is actually matters again, is I, want to be, I want to emphasize that um, it is not a matter of technology. There's not something that's gonna get ever resolved. If you have to forecast solar radiance, which is what you know, drives solar production or wind speed, which is affecting uh, wind generation um, into the future, right? So on any scale, which is a reasonable for, important for economic purposes for where the dollars actually flow on a daily basis, which is again, day ahead or six hours ahead or one hour ahead. This is a typical um, scales for transactions. There's no way we'll ever be able to do this precisely. It has to be with you know, pretty large forecast errors. That's the way weather works. Um, so that's not gonna be something that's gonna, you know, we can hope that technology will solve this in a few years. It's not gonna go away. We've got much, much better at making forecasts for multi days out or to very precisely tracking um, you know, the sort of you know, really short time scale on a, on a matter of minutes, but this is not what's relevant for, um, for the economics. Okay, and those errors are really large, right? So on a day ahead basis, you can talk about 10%, which is huge, right? This is not talking about gigawatts forecast errors, right, daily, right? So it can happen that you know, we can expect uh, 10 gigawatts um, tomorrow at noon of, of solar energy in California and turn out to be only nine actually happening. Yes. Is it okay to interrupt? Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Um, I'm just curious, like these forecasters, on what geological footprint are you talking about or is it like planned? Um, yeah, so, well, so this is percentage, so it doesn't matter. Please what, repeat the question. Oh, sorry, so, so the question was, uh, was a uh, question in the audience about what is the um, um, geographic um, aggregation for the forecast errors. This is percentage, so it doesn't really matter what scale it is. Um, generally, I'm thinking either at the asset level, so one farm, or uh, which actually will be even more than 10% possible. Um, those can be actually quite large. Um, this is more on the um, grid level. Yeah, I'm just going to my yeah. I'm so, percentage, but yes, if it's grid. The largest geographical area, then your errors will be probably more. So That's right. And I'll come back to that. That's right. So, we want to quantify and account for this unreliability, right? It's really about. Um, and, and so, in fact, your question is very relevant because the, this question has been posed for many, many other people. So this is not a new question by any means. Now, what is kind of new is that people generally pose this in a marginal way for one sort of thing, whereas we want to pose this in a multivariate setting across many, many, many assets. All right. So, so let me just very quickly review how the on what happens if they have schedule. So we have the independent system operators ISOs. Uh, we have the, the Kai ISO in California, which is basically, you know, California uh, boundaries. Uh, my main example is going to be about ERCOT, which is the um, ISO in Texas. We have, you know, there's other you know, PGM in the East, 
uh, MISO in the Midwest. Um, so there's about six or seven different um, ISOs in the, within the US, um, which are essentially uh, run independently from each other. Um, so what they do is every day, they get the forecast for tomorrow. So roughly speaking, imagine this is happening at noon. You get a forecast for tomorrow. So the forecast covers everything, right? So basically they have a full menu of what is expected to happen the day the next day. Then they go ahead and they do the unit commitment or uh, SCUC. So this is security constraint unit commitment, right? So they figure out, um, given the forecasted um, demand for power, how many, what units need to be used um, to produce power tomorrow. What is the granularity of the forecast for usage? Is it the same type of, say, a day and a half or something? Or how do, does that also have 10% error? I mean, that what's your normal? Yeah, so, so the- You might want to repeat, repeat that. Sorry. So, yeah, so the question was, what is the granularity of the uh, forecast for demand, I think, right? Or, yeah. yeah. So, um, so demand is, you know, what we call the load uh, in this, in this uh, language. So um, actually, I'm not so sure. So let, let me just be clear. So what, I, what I'm, I'm, I'm pausing on, I'm not sure at what granularity the load is allocated by different regions of the, uh, so that, that allocation by, um, you know, bus level or zone level, or um, I'm not actually so sure. Now that has been going up, uh, the uncertainty on, on the load has been going up dramatically due to behind the meter solar rooftop power. Right, so behind the meter means that if I, on my house I have solar panels, those are essentially invisible to the ISOs. So they cannot, you know, they can try to estimate, but for technically speaking, they don't know I have it, or if I, you know, I pull the plug on it, or I'm, I'm washing it and that's not working right now. And so um, you can see large uncertainties because it's the same um, solar panels, but hiding behind and now counted as net load because what the system sees, the grid sees as a net consumption. So often, you know, people now have negative consumption during the day because they produce more than they consume. So, 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 so this is a, this has actually been an important point. You know, load has been load forecasting has been a bread and butter question you know, for for fifty years, and it used to be you know people thought they got really really good at it, and now there's huge degradations of forecast quality because of the rooftop um, going up, and that's actually been you know one 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 serious challenge to the grid operators is that. The, the, you know, the old load forecasting models don't work anymore. So, so, so what happens is they, they, they do the unit commitment. So this is a very large scale optimization problem, right? The objective function essentially is to minimize generation costs. So find the most cost efficient way to meet demand from all the available supply, right? So um, generally speaking, let's say in California, there's about, um, you know, peak, peak demand can be something like, you know, 60 gigawatts on the grid level. On any given day, probably the day, the, the, the peak demand was only you know, 35 uh, gigawatts. Um, so, you know, there's a huge uh, slack uh, on, a, on a typical day. And so, of course, you have to decide which of the possible units which can produce up to 60 gigawatts will be committed tomorrow. Now, um, all these all this decisions are done on an hourly scale, so 24 hours for tomorrow. And of course, you know, if you have a coal plant, you cannot just run for, for three hours of the day. That's just not physically possible. So if you commit a coal plant, uh, to, or, 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 or a, uh, a gas generator has to be for multiple hours. That's why this is a complicated question to, to make a full plan for the next 24 hours, respecting all the network constraints, right? So all the kind of things like congestion um, um, and other you know, um, constraints. So this, this, this is a large scale optimization problem, something like um, 100,000 variables to, to work out. So, so that's, what, that's the unit commitment. Then the next day, it's so essentially in real time. So this actually happens in several steps, six hours ahead, six hour blocks, and then one hour at a time, you go through and you do the economic dispatch, which is to actually match the actual. So once you have you know, all these units ready to, to produce, most of them can be dispatchable. So you can be turned up and down how much actual power they're gonna generate to exactly match the actuals. And this has to be done um, you know, perfectly um, on a scale of you know, eventually up to submit. Now, what, what does that actually mean? It means that, Today you make the for the, the plan for tomorrow, and tomorrow you're gonna do the real time adjustments. And so the way you're gonna handle that essentially through what's called ancillary services or reserves, right? So you have extra backup units in case that you have uh, not enough um, power being generated to manage the actual, right? So if the the, the you know if you have uh, if you have a shortfall between what you know, demand is versus what you're supplying, you better match it. They don't want to have a brownout happening. So that's why you have a bunch of reserves 
which are available to, to cover that, but those are expensive. And so that means that if you have to call on still reserves and reserves, that's gonna cost you more if, you know, so making a plan for tomorrow is much cheaper than having to mop it up in real time. Okay, and that's been a real fact that the, the, the cost of reserves has been going up essentially exponentially compared to the past, and that's driven by more uncertainty, right? So there's a real economic benefit to try to control, understand the uncertainty, there's a hope that you can actually not spend as much in the reserves as sometimes happens. So there's some kind of a convexity of, you know, coming from the forecast error, so large forecast errors are gonna cost you a lot of money. All right, so, so the goal is to be able to allocate risks so to quantify this uncertainty and you wanna do this at the decision time, at the time of the day had planning. So not after the fact, not a posteriori to say, well, looking back forensically, I can say that, you know, today, uh, these are the assets which didn't perform as reliably as I expected them to, but ahead, ahead, you like to say, well, these are the risky ones that I should watch out um, for this, you know, these wind farms over here. You know, ideally, if you can do that, then um, this is kind of the, the holy grail would be if you can, what risk manage at the decision time, which assets are likely to misbehave and maybe you don't want to use them or, you know, you can adjust your decisions to anticipate the additional costs coming from, from this uncertainty. All right, so again, this has to happen at the time, decision time, so this is the day ahead schedule. So this has to be, somehow you have to think about the counterfactors. What could happen tomorrow and how much is going to cost me to, to know what the risk is? Oh, sorry, yeah. Another question. Um, so I'm thinking about optimization problems, this, this, this very uh -huh. complex optimization problem. And I think to myself, okay, the, the run to run those big optimization problems in like linear programming world, yep. like the That's operations right. research world, depending on that, something that complex could take a while to, to run, uh, I would think. And, and then similarly in the AI world, you know, as you try to do this equivalent of optimization, those could be, so is this something that people do, can do in real time and adjust in real time with, with algorithmically, or is this, they just have to kind of optimize on the fly, or are you going to talk about this in action? Yeah, so, so the question mm -hmm. was, you know, how computationally intensive is to do the unit commitment and the, um, the dispatch, and um, absolutely, you're absolutely right, this, these are large programs which take a long time to run, so Part of our whole project is to actually figure out how might, you know, how fast can we do it? This is an open problem. So this is, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna just mention this briefly, but this has been a piece of our project is to, to figure out how far we can push this and how we can integrate it with the, what we wanna do on the risk side and make it actually practical. So the, this actually was the premise of the project is that you know, we thought we had a very really good um, methodology how to address the question theoretically, it was all very much open, you know, is it actually going to be feasible computationally to make it work? And so we're kind of halfway there. So we're exploring where the, the current limits are and what, you know, which pieces to, you know. And you taking an operations research kind of approach? Yeah. Is that the way to... Thanks. All right, so um, in this story here, right? So the... Um, for the unit commitment, right? It's about minimizing generation costs, right? And so um, which units are gonna call? You're gonna call the cheap units first and the expensive units and you're gonna call only if necessary. Now, um, renewables, right? They have zero marginal cost. Solar energy is free to produce once you have solar panels in place. And so that means that, um, you know, essentially, you know, um, there's they they a generally bidding it at zero so because it's some kind of a, a bidding auction happening that's how it gets a uh, question, yeah. And when you're modeling this, are you accounting particularly in ERCOT, a very wind generation heavy state, for wind units that are bidding in below marginal costs, the cost of the tax credits they're getting, like a production tax credit? So there was a question about um, ERCOT and wind bidding and the, um, the tax credit. Um, honestly, I don't know, so I, I'm not, um, we haven't really got to that point, but you know, what actually, what I think happens, and I'm not sure what if Arco is in the same position, but in many um, ISOs, they are essentially guaranteed to be committed. So this is essentially, so that's really not even part of unit commitment. So they're just gonna be called. That's kind of the, the you know, um, 
know, they're taken out. In, uh, my understanding is in current methods, they're basically just, you know, immediately said that we're going to call on you because it's it's renewable and then and then and they're you know, supposed to be you know ahead of the long, ahead of the queue to all the other units. So um, I think they have. I guess the emphasis is that they are they are guaranteed to be committed. This is this is a take. Okay, so uh, and so, so so the the the, the crux of the problem is that this is kind of um, frustrating thinking from a risk perspective because it's saying that in terms of dollars, every renewable, and now we're going to have hundreds of, of wind farms and hundreds of solar panels, all look the same. There's no way to distinguish them; they're all zero cost. So they all look, you know, exactly the same from outside, which of course we know is not true, right? So some units are more reliable or less uncertainty, or they're more useful than others, right? So it really ma actually matters, you know, when is the uncertainty happening? Where, where is unit located? Um, you know, are, which, which direction, you know, this uncertainty can go? Um, all those things really matter for the grid at the end, but it's are completely obscured by the zero marginal cost issue of the fact that they're all called in. Okay, and so in finance, there's something you know, well-known what people call wrong and right way risk, when you have multivariate systems, some things move in tandem and some can move opposite direction. And it's really, you want to understand this, this, this joint dependence. It's not just a matter of sort of, you know, thinking about the volatility and standard deviations. It's really about the joint dependence. And so um, I'll come back to this, to this picture here, but what it's saying is that in this plot, there is, um, um, we're decomposing the risk across um, solar and wind. And you can see that um, the total risk is essentially 100% coming from the solar units and the wind is basically has a right way risk here. And so, and of course, wind is also uncertain, but it's, it's moving sort of not opposite, but it's essentially moving orthogonally to the um, uncertainties that matters for me economically. And therefore it's, it's not actually um, affecting um, you know, the, 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 the costs, right? So, so that is this, this, this idea of the risk having a direction is critical in a multivariate setup. All right, so um, I'll be talking about this, this, this multiple pieces of this uh, of the Orpheus project. One of them is, is, is addressing what Mark was asking before about um, computationally, you know, being able to run the, the um, unit commitment from dispatch. Um, but I'll be talking today about this, this joint simulations idea. Okay, and so the challenge again is that I would like to do this across many, many renewable assets all jointly. Okay, so this is a question that's been explored in, in, in lots of detail, marginally, one asset at a time, but the kind of getting the correlation structure across many, many assets is um, essentially an open problem. So and I, think, I, think, I think we're getting something which is uh, you know, state of the art, um, not perfect, but sort of better than it used to be. All right, so, so this is kind of where it's going. So what's the point of having the simulations? So once you have the simulations, you can fit them into this um, optimization to spit out the distribution of potential future costs. Again, counterfactually, given the forecast for tomorrow, how, to, what, how much we can expect to pay tomorrow when the actual is actually happen. Okay, and then we can use this distribution to, statist to statistically allocate the risk across different components. Um, and then ideally, once you do that, you can have um, many different financial sounding um, things that can quantify and advertise those risks. You can have anything from indices where you can say, you know, this asset has this higher risk with some quantitative scale compared to this other asset to things like, you know, swaps, um, ratings and so on, um, or even doing some risk, some risk adjusted commitments. So you, you know, take into account the risk of, the, of, each, of each asset in order to improve your decision making to win. All right, and so the idea is that um, the point of doing risk quantification, we can then either hedge or at least transfer risks among the different grid stakeholders. So right now, often what happens is that the cost, the extra cost in order to, from having to carry lots of reserves to cover forecast errors are essentially passed on fully to the consumers. Right? The people who are actually paying now are the, the, the consumers for, of, of power. So for the, the generators are actually not paying for this. Um, this is sort of one of the you know, issues that lots of people complain about renewable generation is that you, know, you build a solar plant, you run it and you say, well, here's free power and they collect all the, all the profit. But essentially the fact that you know, sometimes 
the sun is not shining and you're not there, it's, it's like you're saying it's not my fault, it's the sun's fault, and you essentially walk away um, entirely from, from, from an economic perspective, right? You know, besides not collecting the revenue you might have collected if the sun was there, you're not actually penalized for being absent. Yeah. So the scenario that you're feeding into your security constraint unit functions, are those the ones that are basically just the realizations of potential forecasting? Yeah. So um so, so this this platform structure, this is just this is explaining how the simulation is gonna work. Um the, the I'm not gonna go through all each of the pieces. The point is this is multiple modules, and so this is whole procedure is, is highly non-trivial, um, both in terms of different statistical pieces that have to fit together, but also in terms of um, digesting and um, all the data and then uh, multiple layers of collaboration have to happen. All right, so here's the, um, the case study is this is ERCOT. And so this is, we have um, two different grids. Essentially you have the current grid. So this is how things look like um, more or less today. Um, so there's a, few, a little bit of solar assets um, and there's quite a bit of wind already. Um, but if you look to the future, um, there's something called the 2030 grid. Um, and so this is what we expect to have about 10 times more solar assets um, and about double wind assets. Um, this is, um, all those things are um, semi-realistic. So this means this is not exactly what how real life looks like for data proprietary uh, issues. And the way that people imagine the future is to look into, in, into the interconnection queue, which is when you propose a project that goes into this uh, long list. Um, and you can kind of go through that and you can see what people have thought of building. And you can imagine everything gets built and you end up with 2030 grid. All right, so this is a distribution. So you can see, of course, you know, there's more um, wind in, um, in the west of Texas and more um, solar around. This is the Houston area. Um, and there's also quite a bit of wind in the south. Um, you can see that the, the, the symbols have different scale because the, 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 um, the nominal capacity of the assets can be wildly different. Some of them are like, you know, 10, 10 megawatts, some of them are, are, are 1,000 megawatts. So um, th these are very heterogeneous assets. Um, and of course, you know, the, the underlying technology can also be quite different you know, in terms of how big are the turbines, um, how exactly the solar panels work, and you know, is it uh, um, concentrated and so on and so on. All right, so the... Um, Last thing I want to mention on the slide is that we're going to be focusing on megawatts. So we're not doing anything, you know, lots of other um, groups try to work purely on the, on the weather side, you know, let's model horizontal radiance and then impute solar from that. Or let's try to model wind speeds and then, then figure out how much um, gigawatts come out of that. That to us, this is um, a tricky thing to do because also, of course, the, the, the transfer functions are highly nonlinear um, and, um, you know, this, this, uh, the uncertainty propagation from doing that, um, and, and, and certainly often the transfer functions that have uh, themselves uncertain depending on, on weather conditions. So this, to us, this, this, is, this is a hard way to do a, a certain propagation to, to, the, to the end. So we're gonna just immediately start by modeling the, how much megawatts of energy are being generated. All right, so here, here's the, the, the uh, I'll have a few plots now showing this statistically what's going on. So I have some, some flavor of what the challenges you are facing. So first of all, we're doing day ahead planning. So this means we're not doing unconditional things. We're doing everything as conditions of forecast, right? So there's no sense of um, essentially doing um, kind of a time series where you have one hour at a time unfolding over time. It's not like this. It's today at noon, I got a forecast for the 24 hours of tomorrow. Okay. And then I want to understand how tomorrow is going to look like given that forecast. So here's a typical picture. This is several days. This is a wind farm, um, several days in the winter. Um, you can see a couple of things you can observe. So first of all, the scale here now doesn't go, it's not a megawatt, it's already in fractions. Okay, because um, as I said, you know, given that the capacity um, of the assets is wildly different, um, it's much easier to get everything into zero one production ratios rather than um, nominal megawatts. Now, what you can see here is that um, there's certainly, you know, a typical daily pattern for wind is that it's windy at night and it's very calm during the day. So this is what, this is the waves on the plot. Um, the forecast you can see is that um, the forecast, you know, doesn't want to sort of swing to the extremes, right? So the forecast is coming from um, 
um, weather forecasting model. So this is a European um, medium range weather forecast. Um, this is one of the common ones. Um, and so the forecast, you know, by definition, it's not doing some kind of averaging internally. It kind of says this is the best guess what might happen. And so, you know, if it predicts a windy day, it's not going to say it's going to be like perfect wind and you're going to have maximum actual generation is going to get close, but not exactly versus um, the actual generation, right? Often, you know, it's, it's, there's a natural cap, right? How, how, you know, what's the optimal speed for the turbine to spin? And it can actually hit this quite often. So there's about five percent, you know, there's a lot of zeros and a lot of, a lot of maximums um, for the actuals, right? So the statistically speaking, the forecast and the actual have very different properties, right? So this is the, the red line is less volatile um, and doesn't rarely goes to the zero or to, to maximum compared to the action. Okay, so I just want to mention that there's a lot of people now who offer probabilistic weather forecasts, okay, which means that they, 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 they don't just tell you that we expect um, tomorrow to have you know, wind speed of uh, 20 miles, an hour, 20 miles uh, um, an hour, that should give you a distribution of that. Okay, from our experience, those forecasts are underestimating the actual uncertainty. So they actually, they're not actually matching well the, um, the actual variability. And this happens essentially because they came from the weather forecasting. And so those are all model-based um, um, forecasts. And so they're, they're missing kind of the intrinsic uncertainty kind from sort of, you know, things happening locally or, you know, they're not fully accounting for, um, for what actually happens on the ground. And so the people who actually try to do um, these forecasts, what they do is they take probabilistic forecasts and then they inflate the uncertainty to match the realized, uncertainty, the realized variability in and out. All right, so, so here, here's a, the reason why this, this joint forecast and actuals is, is so critical, right? So this plot shows you the forecast production fraction, everything in fractions versus the actual. So you can see that there's a kind of a cloud of points here that you can see that this, this is, you know, if, if this was, you know, a stat, a stat stock and you see bivariate distribution, right? So I have, some, you know, this is my um, input variable and this is my output. What you expect to see is an ellipse. Right? You don't see an ellipse because you see this, this, this squeezing here at the top. This is a solar asset. And so what this is saying, it's saying that um, when, when I'm forecasting essentially perfect production, this means a really nice sunny day. Then I'm guaranteed to have a perfect sunny day, right? Because in Texas, you know, if, if you if you expect a beautiful sunny day, it means there's no clouds in the you know for hundreds of miles around you, and there's really nothing that can mess this up, right? So you can have essentially a perfect forecast um, for sunny days. On the other hand, for forecasting you know clouds, intermittent clouds, you're going to have a huge uncertainty that actually might might transpire tomorrow. Right? So, so, there's a, so the, um, the conditional variance of actuals is highly dependent on the forecast. And that's why this is critical that you cannot just talk about unconditionally how tomorrow might look like. It's all about what was the forecast going in. This is, this is, so this, this is a solar asset. Here's a wind asset um, during the um, afternoon, again, which mostly it's not windy. So you can see most of the points are close to zero. And again, you have the same feature where so if I'm forecasting essentially no wind, then I'm expecting to see a little bit of wind, maybe, but mostly, you know, often no wind. On the other hand, if I'm forecasting um, kind of quite windy, but not sort of, you know, extremely windy, then again, there's a huge spread in the middle here. And so again, this is very far from being a nice elliptic, elliptic question. Okay, this is just another plot showing again how the actuals and the forecasts look like. Um, again, I want to point out there's a lot of times we get exactly once um, for the solar, and this is this perfect solar, um, you know, producing the maximum possible. Um, and also, you can see that the, the forecasts actually have a bias. So this is again, this is a few, this is a, um, the problems that the weather forecasters have is that their, their forecasts um, end up somehow being biased. So they actually don't care about unbiased forecasts. Um, as a statistician, I care about this a lot. Um, but generally speaking, um, the, the or these weather forecasters tend to underestimate systematically wind and overestimate sun. Okay, now, you know, this is not a problem, right? So um, I 
we can detrend, so this is what do we we, 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 we detrend ourselves to make sure things are unbiased. So this is not a, a challenge, it's just, a, it's just a something that you have to be aware of and realize that the forecast is not actually the gold standard. It's just something that the weather, um, you know, prediction system spit out and you have to, then you have to monitor it yourself. All right, so this is kind of the plan of what we do to get simulations. We, we rescale everything to be in zero ones. Then we rescale more because for example, for in the next slide here. Yeah, so, right, of course, um, with the solar production, it's all about when the, where the sun is in the sky. So depending on the time of the year, the sun you know, starts uh, rises sooner or later um, and the sun can go higher and lower in the sky. Therefore, it's gonna affect how high, how much energy you can get, right? So you know that you can generate more solar power and during the summers and during the winter. And so you have to account for all these patterns. None of these patterns are actually nice. So this is not, you can see this is not, um, well, this is kind of like a trick curve, but in fact, but now these curves are easily to um, describe using the formula. Essentially, we're doing, we're doing everything. We just estimate statistically given the data we have um, to see what can happen, right? And so you see here, for example, that um, the maximum actually is, is almost like flat for several months of the year. Um, it's all about you know, what angle is, 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 is the farm facing and, and what the local conditions um, to sort of see, you know, um, so essentially it's, it's too hard to work out physically what's going on. And so it's, it's usually much easier and better we think to statistically just learn those envelopes. Um, let me skip this picture, but this, this picture is just, is just pointing out the same issue. So this is saying that, um, okay, so, so this plot is showing the conditional mean variances of for, for, for wind assets on a given day across many, many assets. So this is 264 different wind assets. Um, and so what this picture is saying is that, generally speaking, as I, as I, as I mentioned, um, wind is being underestimated. So if, you, if, if your forecast product, production ratio is, is, is 0.5, so half as much as you can ex, you know, ideally expect, then actually it's going to be more like 0.6 on average in actuals. Okay, so that's, this is bigger than zero. Um, and this is the conditional variance, standard deviation. And you can see this, this, this general shape of up and down. So it says when, when the forecast is for almost no wind, you expect very little uncertainty on that. When the forecast is for about you know, half, of, half the maximum, you expect a huge uncertainty. And then this thing kind of slopes down. So when it's going to be really windy, again, the certainty goes down. I have maybe 10 minutes. Is that right? Or? Um, yeah, it, it, you have till five o'clock, including questions. So you can, okay. you can kind of manage it yourself. So um, we spend most of our time trying to get the dependent structure correct. So what we have, again, we have a very large covariance matrix to, to estimate. Um, and doing that is, of course, is, is you know, statistically unstable. Um, because we only have a few hundred data points. So we don't have, you know, um, decades of data to look at, we only have two years. And so, um, you know, doing this, this estimation of the covariance because the correlation structure is, is a challenging statistical problem. And so this is a well-known problem. And so, um, you know, de depending on what kind of in the context you have, there's different tools to, to attack it. Um, and so we, we came up with this, um, um, clustering approach, where essentially we're gonna, instead of having to estimate one large covariance matrix, we're gonna recursively estimate small sub matrices and then patch them all together, hierarchical. All right, so um, this is actually done using um, simulated annealing, which is a, um, an optimization search method um, in the space of this, of this, of this potential clusters, um, which tries to find the best clustering that um, you know, it gives you a good way to patch those things together. Um, so this is because the statistical contribution of, of, of this um, um, piece of the project was, was, was doing this. Um, and this, is, this you know, at least parts of this are, are, are new into the literature. Um, so this is just illustrating how those clusters look like. So this is, um, this is uh, supposed to be su you know, superimposed on the map of Texas. So this is actually the geographical locations. And so um, what we do, of course, right? So this is another um, natural challenge you're going to face is that Right, every asset has a longitude latitude coordinates. And so of course, it's very clear that um, you know, assets which are close together spatially are gonna have high correlation, right? Because it's all coming from, you know, if there's clouds in an area, there's a cloud and there's nothing to do with the clouds over there, generally speaking. Now, um, 
you know, in practice, you know, you have things like mountains and urban areas and whatnot. So the spatial structure is there, but it's hard to capture it in a way that you're going to trust it. You're not imposing your own views on the data. And so we're actually not capturing directly the spatial um, dependence. We are kind of checking. And so in this approach, we're just checking after the fact that makes sense. So you can see here that the clustering that we found, which was not aware of the long latitudes um, of the assets, is respecting the, 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 um, the spatial structure. You can see that the, the clusters have generally a, you know, a, geogra a geographic relationship, which makes sense. Right? You don't have strange thing that tries to cluster this asset with this one over there. You don't see anything reaching across. Um, so that's, that's a good way to check that. Um, things are making sense. You can see kind of patterns that you expect, right? You see this the coastal um, region wants to be together versus the, here's the far west. Um, here's kind of the, um, the panhandle and the um, north central, and this is kind of the, the east and the Dallas area, right? So they have a kind of a natural um, structure that you might expect if you know a little bit of the geography of Texas and its weather. Um, again, another thing which is quite, uh, quite you know, Important is that some assets have really high correlation. So if you have two solar farms right next to each other, which can happen, then they're going to have like 0.995 correlation and basically have exactly the same output up to some scaling factor. Um, and so you want to make sure that it doesn't get ruined as you do the statistical estimation. All right. So here's here's what comes out, right? So I want I want to get to the risk allocation um, and, and 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 the and the and the uh, end of the talk. So this is the output of this whole procedure. So we have Here's what um, a typical example. So this is a given day. Um, this was the, the green as a forecast. So the forecast was essentially for saying for, um, now this is back into megawatts. So the forecast was saying it's gonna be a beautiful sunny day um, and you know, it's gonna be all perfect. Um, then the, the actual shift is gonna be much, 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 quite a bit lower. So there's actually a lot of cloud in the morning. Um, and some clouds in the afternoon, I guess. It was not, not as actually close to, to, the, to the forecast. The forecast was pretty bad. Um, so the, what you can see, you can see the, um, the blue line is the average scenario again. So this, this shows a thousand scenarios, um, all aggregated. You can see a few gray lines. This has 20 individual scenarios. Um, and you can see some different shading indicating the quantiles of a thousand scenarios. This is all um, for a given asset. Here's one more. This says um, this is a wind asset on the same day. Um, you know, for the wind, it was really windy at night, um, and then it was uh, kind of calm um, during the day. So you can see this is a large wind farm it has you know capacity of 600 megawatts. So this is quite quite large. Um, and so the again the actual is in red. Um, the green is the forecast. So here you can see that the forecast it was it was more than the forecast um, in the morning, and then it was. Um, less than the forecast um, in the afternoon, and then again it was basically max um, in the at, at, at in the evening. This 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 the percentages are showing how many of the scenarios are are are, are at max, right? So there's a large point max, right? So it's saying there's about fifty percent chance that given the forecast, it's going to be hitting exactly the maximum possible generation at night. Right? So this is this is you know this is a huge point mass. Right, so the distribution of scenarios is like um, it has a nice continuous distribution in here, and then there's about you know fifty percent that can be exactly the maximum capacity of this of this plant. Now, again, what we have, what we what we produce or produce are joint scenarios. So we have scenarios which are you know sorted. We have a thousand thousand scenarios, and they're matched up across assets. So scenario one here, right? You cannot see it, but there's a scenario one here is exactly the same thing as scenario one here. Right, they're matched up, they're joint. So then I can just add them up, for example, to get the total generation, let's say for wind in the far west zone. The far west is about 50 assets in, you know, towards El Paso. Um, and you can add them up and you can see the distribution of the um, total generation in, in the far west on the same day. Now, um, back to your question, right? So there's certainly quite a bit of um, diversification happening reduction of uncertainty as you added multiple assets, right? Because, you know, wind doesn't blow a bit less here, but more there, and so it adds up, you, you reduce uncertainty, right? So you can see this here happening, right? So this band here is, relatively speaking, much, much, much narrower than here. Okay, so that's, of course, is happening, but 
um, again, essentially, this, this, this is a state of the art method where we can rigorously sort of vouch that this is producing something reasonable um, rather than just you know, kind of coming up with ad hoc rules again. So a picture like this has been, you know, multiple other papers have this, multiple other groups can do that. None of them can do this picture, which is adding up 54 plots like this together in a rigorous way to, to be able to have the distribution of the sum. Okay, so in fact, we have this thing now um, on, uh, okay, it, it, it's, off, it's off today, but it's, there's an FTP site. Um, and if you can have a, if you know the, where to access it and, and, and a password to connect, then you can um, actually submit your own forecasts and then you're gonna get simulations back as many as you want. So this thing is, is, is sort of up and running as an engine that people can submit requests. And so, you know, right now it's, it's calibrated to, to ERCOT, um, but essentially um, the, the, the statistical methodology is, is, is um, you know, scalable to you know, any other ISO in, in, in the country around the world. All right, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about this much, but so this, this is the, um, a related challenge to this project is of course, you know, so, so now we, we, I, I show you this picture, right? And I'm claiming that this is, this is really good and this is quite nice. Um, and again, but you know, what, all, all I can claim at this point is just saying, well, I have a, um, you know, a robust and rigorous statistical method underlying how this came about, right? If you really wanna prove or, or sort of, you know, quantify that this is really good, this is actually capturing reality, right? You have to do a forecast assessment. Now it's, it's hard because this is probabilistic, right? So I'm not trying to assess, I'm not, I'm not claiming my forecast, my point forecast, right? I'm not claiming that this blue line is a good, is a good answer. I'm claiming that the whole distribution is good, right? So I have to compare distributions to realizations across many, many, many samples, right? And this is of course, you know, we have lots of data, right? We're generating, you know, if you have, have a thousand scenarios, as I showed you, 24 hours, 490 assets, which is what the my airport that case study has, 365 days a year, this is four gigabytes of data coming out of my model, right? And this is the thing I wanna assess. I wanna say, are those four gigabytes of numbers I'm spitting out, are those, you know, meaningful, correct, statistically speaking, or they're just garbage and this is just, you know, I'm sticking my finger in the air and saying this is a good answer. Right, so, so this, is a, this is a challenging question you know, one because it's all data. Two because it's 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 it's, a, it's hard to pinpoint what you actually want to assess. Right? Are you are talking about um, you know, interval forecasts. You want to be some bounds. Are you talking about um, marginals? You're talking about joint at the zonal level, joint at the um, grid level. What do you actually want to compare? So this is a whole separate topic um, which we spend quite a bit of time um, looking into. And so we have. Um, some, you know, we have a whole battery of tests we, we, we tried um, and the answer is, you know, it's, it's you know, as far as we can tell, this is the best, you know, we, we're better than anybody else. Do you look at the correlations between the two sides? So for example, when it's very sunny in Texas, it's also pretty hot in Texas. So, so demand and supply, supply on the solar side and demand from the you know, air conditioning use or whatever, do you have models that look across that way? Short answer, yes, you're talking about net load, right? Net load is subtracting load minus generation. Yes. So, yeah, so, I mean, again, this, you know, the, the, the challenge in here, right, is that everything we're doing is conditions of forecast. And so a lot of those things that people are kind of worried about are hopefully taking care of the forecast. It better be right? the fact that if you know, the forecast should really have this issue is that if tomorrow is gonna be hot, because you know, actually, I don't. I, I, I cannot see. It. I only can see the solar, the solar generation. I cannot tell the temperature. You know, I don't. We don't actually have the information. You know, stored up. But you know, the forecast will be knowing that if the storm is going to be hot, that means it's going to be. You know, load is going to be looking like this, and for gener solar generation will look like this. Right. So that should be already inside baked into the forecast itself. And then we want to understand the uncertainty on that. Right. So the question is, which way is the uncertainty going to move? Conditional. All right, so let me skip this, but this, this, is, this is one task you can call it called PET. What you should be having is something which is looking like a flat histogram. Um, here's a competitor, which looks very much non-flat, and here's ours, which is you know, close, close enough to flat, right? You're never gonna get it perfect, 
but this looks much more, much better than um, the comparator. All right, so let me skip this for a second and let me talk the last five minutes about the, the risk allocation. So, so this is a question, okay, so now you have the simulation engine. What is it, what, 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 what is it good for? So, right, you want to like understand how the costs are affected by stochasticity, by the uncertainty. Okay, so how much extra you're going to end up paying because you have uncertainty. Okay, and so again, you're, you're paying extra during the economic dispatch when, you re, when, the, when the real life turns out to be different from your forecast. Okay, and so the way you're going to do it, you're going to measure the difference of costs between the ideal world where nothing is uncertain, things are exactly like the forecast says, and the our world, so this is our model world, where we, 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 we trust our scenarios and say the scenarios will fully capture what the, the counterfactual, what, what is the counterfactual is going to be. Okay, so here's a typical plot. So this is distribution of costs across 1,000 scenarios. Okay, and these units are, I guess, in $10 million. So this is, I guess, how much it costs to run the Texas grid per day. Okay, and so you have the, so original is, with all the renewables being uh, the way they are across a thousand scenarios. And this is the idealized, idealized means that we pretend this is only one, one case where we pretend that the, everything is gonna turn out exactly like the forecast. Okay, as far as the renewables are concerned, there's, this, there's still distribution because these, uh, I assume the load is here is not idealized. The load is still distributed. So you can see these two are not so far apart. Okay, so this is maybe you know, good news, but you can see that if you look at the, the tail, which is what you actually care about. This is, this is the, the worst case, right? the most expensive cases. Then the tail, the red tail is um, thinner here than the, the gray. So this, this should be great. So somehow should this all around. What's going on? Maybe it's, maybe I picked a funny day where things actually got all around. And I wasn't looking at it closely. So I have multiple days. It looks like this day actually is a single flip. So the red has a longer tail than the black. Um, but then we're going to compare the tail because this is the, what people would call conditional value at risk. Um, and so this is the, the extreme cost. This is what, you know, this is what people are worried about, right? In, in terms of having to, to pay um, millions of extra dollars because of the forecast. And so what we have, we have, um, again, this is the type of picture I showed you at the beginning. So let me come back to it. So again, so what is it saying? It's saying that the, um, okay, you, I should have had the, the axis labeled here, but the, the, the worst thing happening is right here. And this is exactly the late afternoon, right? So as um, certainly in California, but also in Texas, um, the most problematic situation is the late afternoon when the sun goes down, because the sun, when the sun goes down, the wind doesn't pick up immediately. And what happens that that's when the, the load is the highest. And so this is the big ramping happening the afternoon. And so any errors are very expensive because a bunch of units are being started on already. And so there's nobody else to ready to come in except the peakers, which are really pricey. So this is a well-known fact that you expect the highest risk to be in the afternoon. And this is picture saying it's coming from, from the sun to so the solar units. Um, and then again, as I mentioned before, the wind, as essentially, you know, of course, of course, at night, right? There's no sun at all, so all the risk is fully coming from, from, the, from the wind. Um, and again, the, and on this particular day, the the night was was windy, and that means a lot of uncertainty, and so that's why there's quite a bit of risk again. Um, but during the day, there's less wind, but it's not zero. But the the wind uncertainty essentially doesn't matter. It doesn't 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 affect cost in any way. It's kind of like you know, run of the mill uncertainty, which is you know, a few thousand dollars more, more or less. It's not affecting costs in a, in, a, in a significant way. So this is a, a right way risk on the wind versus the sun is the wrong way risk during the day, right? And this is that with the composition, which is if you don't have the methodology, you'll not be able to tell that in the midday, there's, there's, there's some wind and there is a lot of solar, but you won't say that 100% of the risk came from the solar. Right? This is not an a priori obvious answer to, to give. So um, let me, okay, let me, I want to show you one movie and come back to this picture and I'll stop. So um, I want to go to this. I, I, people cannot see this. Um, OK. 
Okay, let me see if I can reshare this. All right, so this, so this is showing the, 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 the Texas um, grid. And so what you can see is that um, this is showing all the solar and wind generators. Um, and um, this is running through um, December 19th. Um, and what it's showing, it's showing the colors represent the risk of the assets. So this is the allocation of the risk across assets. And so what it's showing is that most of the things are very, very light. So this was not a very risky day in absolute scale. But you can see that um, the things flaring up are mostly in the, um, the West Texas, right? So again, which is not something you can immediately tell by just staring at the data, but the West is more risky than, let's say, the uh, coastal region or um, the, the North, uh, North Central region. Right? So the, the worst offenders, so to speak, are happening in the far West. And so again, so the way to, to be able to capture this, right? The only way you can see that is that you have to run the full optimizer to see all the congestion effects, right? You will not see the zonal um, and the grid network um, effects without doing this large scale optimization. This is, this is the next piece of, the, of this pipeline where this, um, this actual grid itself becomes essential and the zonal decomposition become interesting to look at. Okay, so this is something that, you know, we hope to have this as a, um, okay, not, um, Right, so this is something you know we hope to have as a dashboard where on a, on a rolling basis you know you give us a forecast and in a, in a, okay we I think we'll take us you know, a few hours but hopefully in the evening you can have a picture like this where these things going to be happening tomorrow. All right, so um, give me one more minute and I'll stop. So um, come back. All right, let me reshare this last time. Okay, so this is, this is going to be quite different, but um, I did want to mention that um, another reason people you know, care a lot about joint uncertainty across assets is something like this, right? So a lot of people and a lot of universities, companies come out and say they're running on 100% renewables now. <coughs> and this is a popular thing to say. Now, what does it actually mean? Right. Generally, they mean that this is a volumetric. They mean, you know, Stanford figures out how much energy they use in a year, and then they figure out how many renewable energies they buy, and they say, look, this is the same. You know, we're spending, you know, we need 100 megawatts in a year, and we bought 100 megawatts of renewable energy, therefore we're 100% um, renewable. That's, that's volumetric, right? This is um, quite problematic because this is just a big average. And so it's actually not saying that Stanford is not contributing anything to um, yeah. um, carbon emissions, right? Because what you really want to have, you want to have sort of full offsets where things are not averaged on some very long time scale, but something like real time, right? So on an ongoing basis, right? You can essentially say that if you pretended that, you know, you could have disconnected from the grid and you would still be running on 100% renewable energy. Not, you know, not like my house where I'm producing a lot of solar during the day, but I'm bored and I have to import a bunch of back at night. And so therefore um, I am definitely responsible for a bunch of carbon emissions from all the gas speakers that I have to have to have my lights on at 7 p.m. So the only way it's gonna work, right? So the way, how are you gonna do this? How are you gonna do this full offset? And some companies are trying to do this right now. Right? This, um, you know, Google data centers are trying to get to this part where they will really claim, they'll say we are really, um, carbon neutral, right? To do that, you have to actually have a portfolio. Right? You have to go ahead and you have to procure renewable energy from a bunch of sources that, that, that you have enough diversification that you tame the uncertainty and you have a way to, you know, back it up, right? So suddenly you see that there's not, no wind coming in, well, you have something else backing up so that you can match it up, right? And of course, you have some planning required, but it's not only perfect, right? It's going to be all, always probabilistic, right? You will not be able to do it 100% for sure. But in any case, yeah, you have to some kind of portfolio construction where you have to understand, you know, if I'm bought wind from this part of Texas and I bought some solar from another part of Texas, how much of the total is going to be to cover my actual losses, right? So this is where joint dependence will become essentially. All right, so let me stop. Um, so this is ongoing, but um, I guess I want to just highlight the, the keywords. So risk measures, this is a financial 
um, concept, which you know, we are advocating as the right tool for this um, risk quantification. Um, and then of course, is this, the scaling questions and going back to the question about efficiency and not efficiency, but you know, computational intensity, how, what is actually feasible to do? Um, we are learning this, but this is certainly um, quite a bit of uh, um, GPU costs as at Princeton running, running our, our simulations now to kind of have a sense of what, what it takes to have this you know, in production. Um, and ultimately, um, our play is all about tech to market. So um, you know, they, they don't want to see papers. They want to see something put into commercial use. Um, and so we are um, sort of you know, in touch with uh, all kinds of um, commercial companies to see how we can you know, license or um, commercialize um, this, this, this method. All right. So let's thank the speaker. And then uh, are there any more questions in Marjit? Do you have anything going to so I'm just curious um, about your allocating risk for methods. Um, do you allocate the risk within your optimization problem, or is it like you run your optimization problem and then allocate risk based on LMPs or whatever else going out to basically improve your congestion? Yeah, excellent question. So yeah, so ideally. Ideally, what you want to so repeat, repeat, repeat. sorry. So the question was about how we're allocating risk. Are we are we doing it inside the optimizer or outside of it? Essentially, um, so ideally you want to do um, stochastic optimization because you know you know something is, is uncertain and so and you have to make decisions and so you should be you should be accounted for as a certainty inside the decision making library. Um, stochastic optimization for power grid is open problem um, and we have some ideas. In fact, we you know we've kind of proposed this to our place that we know how to get started on this from our perspective. Um, our play said that um, that's too too far out in terms of you know practice and so in terms of you know some things that you know they're willing to fund that they want to fund that. So like um, you know essentially everybody else you know right now the optimization is fully deterministic. So it doesn't have any understanding of uncertainty. So what we're doing, we're, we're running it again and again and collecting the outputs like you know, LNPs or um, you know, basically the, 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 the realized cost of, of, of providing the energy um, you know, during the dispatch. Um, so we are rerunning the deterministic optimization many, many, many times. You know, it's not as bad as it sounds because of course, you know, it's all similar runs. So you can kind of figure back and you can have a warm start, but essentially it's rerunning the same thing again and again. So the risk doesn't inform the optimization problem. Not so this is the last step. So this will be the step where it's a, it's a feedback loop, right? So they have the feedback loop. Um, you know, it's, it's conceptually very attractive. Now, practically speaking, this requires, you know, the, right? we have our optimization, which is a proxy of what the ISO is supposed to be doing. The ISO, Claims are doing the same thing, but they won't tell you the details because this is, you know, they're not in that business. I always really, try to, to, to proxy what the, what the system operator actually does. Um, so if we're going to mess with the optimization itself, then it has to be, you know, somebody has to be convinced to actually put it in the, in, into, into production. That's a tough, tough you know, task, given all the regulation and everybody else who might, you know, has a stake in what this thing is doing. So because, you know, this is changing how this, this, you know, things are done, right? So this, 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 is, a, um, this is a lot of inertia of how people are used to doing it. And so they, you know, the whole college industry will build around trying to proxy what the, how the ISO operates. Um, and so that's why, you know, people, you know, specialize how Elkut operates, how PGM operates, how, you know, and why ISO does it. And everybody has their own little quirks. Um, but, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a accepted fact that the, the optimization is not run in the abstract. There's always a human in the loop somewhere trying to twiddle with something a little bit to, to make it, you know, is it more stable and more acceptable to the stakeholders? So if it's downstream, so when LMPs are high, which is basically reflecting that heating lamp and peak hours, how do you allocate like high risk during those hours? Um, versus other hours than the system adjustments. 
yeah, so this so the, 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 this happens again. This is this sort of happens organically, right? So because you're gonna have a scenario which is you know has a shortfall in that hour, and that's gonna be turned out to be really costly. So therefore, that's gonna show up in my distribution of cost. Right? It's gonna show up in this picture exactly, right? So one of those guys is probably like what you just said. This is a scenario, the counterfactual where I'm way below on the solar production at 5 p.m. That's gonna be very expensive. So that's gonna drive up my, my, my cost, and therefore it's gonna show up in my risk. That's exactly the, the, the logic. Questions in the room? Oh, got another one here. Yeah. yeah, I guess just to play devil's advocate a little bit here, and thanks very much for the interesting talk. So if when LMPs are high, we assume that that's incentivizing fast wrapping resources, the grid needs to come into the market, let's call it long duration battery storage. Um, how do you weigh kind of the overall value to end stakeholders of having, say, a, a closer optimization here versus the entrance of more storage to be able to kind of solve solve this risk problem? On that end? Yeah, I mean, this is yeah. Absolutely. So the question was about, um, let's say, value of storage, or you know, what should be the solutions to this this risk question. So um, that's absolutely right. I mean, you're, you're, I agree with everything you said, right? So this is, this is basically outside the scope of what we're doing. We're taking the grid as given. So we're not doing anything to the grid itself. So the question of if you add you know, transmission lines or more of this asset or you know, modify the technology or we put storage or do something else, this is all outside the scope. You know, we're saying given the grid as it is or as somebody imagines it might be, what would be the risk inside that grid? Then, of course, you know the real question would be: Okay, how? What do I do with that information, right? If I know that this is where my risk is coming from, right? If I know that the solar is driving my risk, what should I do about it, right? So maybe you should say, well, you know, maybe I should couple solar and, and, and storage, and I can figure out how much storage I need, right? But essentially, it means that you know, for our perspective, right? It means it means you have to tell me, okay, here's your proposal of where you're going to storage is going to go. You tell me how the storage has been, you know, operated. You know, is it dispatched or you know, is it coupled to something else? I can go back and redo my scenarios and redo my risk allocation. I'll tell you what the impact on the risk is. Then you can decide if you like this or not. So, I mean, that's, that's essentially right. This is this is the whole story. We, we look at sort of two case studies: today's grid and this twenty thirty grid, which somebody completely different team imagined that's how it's going to turn out to be. We can compare these two. You, know, you can come up with more of those and have, you know, right? so then you, you, when, once you have this pipeline, you can kind of do a, a bunch of this analysis to say, if you modify the grid, what is the value? Um, and how, you know, but doing this a risk, a risk allocation kind of gives you sort of monetizing this, 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 this idea of uncertainty um, into dollars. It'd be really cool if you can incentivize storage of using that risk for the entire system. So yeah. Like here in your, that's right. Allocating risk for the storage will probably still make money just through LMP, but if you can give it somehow like quantify that reduction in risk and give like allow the storage to capture that value. That's that's the hope of having some kind of financial contract which would facilitate this, this make it easier to see and um, you know transfer this type of things. Yeah. This this is Market. kind of yeah. But the risk is still not captured. So, sorry, so I mean, if I just add, so, so you know, to, like, to your question, actually, like, so one, one, you know, another use case could be something like saying, you know, if you're going to think of a new project, a new plan to build, and you have, you know, two or three choices, then they can use, you know, this method to kind of see the impact on the risk of the different projects you might consider. And, you know, you, know, you can maybe say, well, you know, you can probably, you know, explain to ISO that this, you know, look, this, this is really going to help you manage your whole grid if you let me just build this project, right? So this is versus, you know, this competitor project is, 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 is trash because it's, it's actually makes the risk worse, right? So you could see that this could be a, you know, decision support for even like, you know, planning, long-term planning, right? If you can pinpoint where, what's, what's happening. Because right now it's kind of, no, it's in the software have you making these decisions. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.
you, Rajit, Michael, you guys I know you've spoken, but... Once, yeah, it's just, yeah. yeah. I had to think for a, for a minute when you came in who, you know, who, who am I looking at, so <laughs> good to see you again, yeah. Yeah, right. Give me a second, too. I know. Oh, sorry, so this is uh, somebody had raised a hand on. on... Uh, let's see. No, do you want to? Would you like to uh, ask a question? Uh, yeah, so do investigators like you spend time on the issue of, in a perfect world, who would be investigating and collecting this data and coming up with insights? for perfecting or minimizing, I guess would be the right way to say it, minimizing the, the current inability to forecast accurately. Like if what, should we not be looking to the ISOs? Should there be some new organization of, of investigators working perhaps together, perhaps independently around the world so that in, say in five years or 10 years, we're able to minimize this forecast inaccuracy? Because uh, from my perspective, I'm not a student, I'm a solar contractor. I don't trust the utility. I don't trust the grid planners. Maybe that's overly cynical, but you being uh, a data expert, who should be working on this problem? So in five or 10 years, internationally, we're just much, much better at it. Thanks for the question. So let me try to summarize it. So the question was about data collection and how to um, yeah, have a more open community about doing this, this uncertainty analysis. Um, that's, that's a hard, that's a really hard task. So um, I, I guess I want to go back and, and explain that everything I showed today, um, this came from an ARPAE sponsored data plan, um, which is itself you know, has multiple teams involved. Um, and that's highly non-trivial. So the, all the data is actually synthetically generated. It's coming from reanalysis of, of, of past weather um, you know, stored um, measurements and then um, rerunning the weather models to understand the, what, you know, what was the actual wind in this location of, in Texas in 2017. That was not actually measured. There's no, there's no ground measurement. This is all synthetically generated because the, um, we don't, we, that data just basically doesn't exist. So either it's exists and it's not um, publicly available to anybody. Um, or, you know, this, and we tried to get some ND, NDA signed and this was a ongoing problem. So this is not you know, dragged into years. Um, but, um, or you know, we, have, you know, we have weather stations and the weather stations are not exactly where the, 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 the assets are and then that modeling that uncertainty is a, is a whole separate problem, right? So if I know what the, the weather station measurement was you know, on campus and I have a, um, you know, solar panels on my, on my house five miles away, okay, how can I use that to, to figure out how much I'm producing? That's a whole separate um, task, but the, the data challenge is, is quite severe um, and so, you know, for for planning purposes, right? You can you can certainly purchase locally. Um, you know, for a given site, what you think your 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 um, production looks like. But this this is not no nowhere close to what we need, which is we want to understand jointly how to interact with the rest of the system to assess to assess, to assess the risk. So I don't have an answer to what should be the the right model going forward. But essentially, essentially, this is complementary to what I'm describing is that. What kind of data should you be proactively um, obtaining? I, I'm not sure. We've, we had some discussions about how can we combine what we have, which is again coming from RPI, with let's say public uh, weather observation data. But that seems another few years of work to understand really what to do. He raised his hand again, but I don't know. <laughs> I think we'll. I think we'll call it. Okay, yeah. Mar Marcus calling it a day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.